Hello, everyone. This is the third segment of my series on death and afterlife in the Western world, primarily at this point, the ancient Western world. And today I want to talk about ancient Greek views of death and the afterlife. I want to go from Homer to Plato. And in doing so, we're going to see this great shift that takes place. Later, we might talk about the causes of it, but today I just want to describe it to you and illustrate it to you from some archaeological evidence as well as textual evidence. So let me start my screen share and we'll take a look at the slides that I've put together that I think will be the best way to illustrate this. I put right here the first slide just a reminder of the ancient Near East view, which would include the Hebrew Bible, where you had these three levels of heaven is the world of the divine, and then the flat disk of the earth is the human realm, the world of the living breathers, the world of humanity, and then the underworld. In the ancient Hebrew Bible, it's called Sheol. Remember in the Babylonian Gilgamesh epic, it's called Kernurgia, the land of no return. And in the Greek world, it's called Hades or Hades. It's named after the god Hades who rules over the underworld in Greek mythology. But basically, Hades means not seen. So it has also that attribute of mystery to it, particularly as we're going to start in Homer. But before we get to Homer, just a reminder of what we covered in terms of these views, because I'm, I've always been struck by the way that they're culturally different in some of their reference points and their characters and their vocabulary and descriptions, but conceptually, they're very much the same. So here's Psalm 115. We covered it before in the first segment, but it's a nice summary. The heavens are the Lord's. Whenever you see capital L-O-R-D, that's the divine name, Yahweh or Jehovah. Will is was, remember, the eternal God. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he's given to the children of men. The dead do not praise Yahweh or the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So remember that term silence, because we're also going to see that same kind of thing in Homer. And also, this is from the Gilgamesh epic. It's my favorite passage where the barmaid uh, Siduri says to Gilgamesh when she asks him, what are you doing? Uh, where are you? Why are you roaming the world? What are you trying to find? And he says, I'm trying to find the secret of eternal life. And she says, you will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created man, they allotted to him death, but life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things day and night, night and day, dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. Let your clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand and make your wife happy in your embrace, for this too is the lot of humankind or mankind. Now in Homer, we're just going to do a single text just to make the point. We've got in book 11 of the Odyssey, this journey that Odysseus makes to the underworld to visit the slain hero Achilles, remember? And this is just so full of meaning that I think it can help us just to capture the whole ancient Greek view. So Achilles is in the underworld. He's been dead. And even though he rules or is a hero down there, and he's very honored in the underworld of Hades, uh, he's told by Odysseus what the common view that people would have, basically that he's well-remembered in the world above, the world of the living. Remember, he's down in Hades. So here Odessa says, but you, Achilles, there's not a man in the world more blessed than you. There never has been and never will be one. In other words, you're being remembered as much as anyone who's ever lived. Time was when you were alive, we Argives honored you as a god. And now, 
I, down here I see you lord it over the dead in all your power, so grieve no more at dying great Achilles. So you see the comfort that's been given to him by Odysseus is essentially not eternal life, but don't be grieved at dying. You're in the underworld, but it's a world in which you clearly are the most honored of all. You're, he calls him, the ruler of the dead. You lord it over the dead in all your power. So then uh, I reassured the ghost, but he broke out protesting. The ghost is, of course, Achilles. In order to get him to even kind of come forth and be kind of quasi-living, he had to offer a little blood. The idea of blood is life. Remember in the ancient Hebrew view, too, blood is life. Breath is life, and now you're in the world of the dead, the unseen world below that is dark and silent with very little going on. And notice what Achilles says. This is the main thing. I'm going to highlight it here. No winning words about death to me, shining Odysseus. You know, don't talk to me about death. Don't tell me how I should not grieve at dying. By God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive then rule down here over all the breathless dead. Isn't that interesting? The breathless dead. Remember in the Hebrew Bible, your breath goes forth, you return to the earth. And here, remember, it's not non-existent. None of these ideas of death and afterlife, whether it's Gilgamesh or the Hebrew Bible or here Homer's Odyssey, the dead exist. So it's not annihilation in that sense. It's just not life. It's death. The breathless dead, as they're called. But notice what he says. I'd rather be a slave on earth for another man, not a ruler, not a great hero, but just a slave, or a dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive. Isn't that very vivid? Then rule down here over all the breathless dead. It's an amazing text. So in the time of Homer, basically 700s, 8th century BCE, we begin to get a glimpse of the ancient Greek view of death. Heaven above where the gods are, the earth below where humans live, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the planets, uh, in the dome of heaven, and then the world of the dead. So whether you call it Shio, or the land of no return, or Hades, the unseen realm, that is, it's not life. Death is death, and there's no sense of coming back. Only he's able to call up the ghost. Now, what we begin to notice, and we don't know exactly where this came from, one idea that's pretty convincing to me at least is that it began to come from the east maybe from india or from iran or persia certain changes begin to take place and this text that you look at right here i think it's the most amazing archaeological find in the ancient world in terms of greek archaeology it's a little foil piece of gold just like we would talk about tin foil, you can carefully roll it up because gold is can be pounded out very thin and be very pliable. And then it's been inscribed with what some have called a prayer for the dead. So these are called lamella or lamellae. Uh, some, some call them Orphic plates, perhaps associating them with the Orphic religion. But as you're going to see here, they're very generic in terms of what they actually say. So where are they found? They're found in tombs and they're rolled up. If you discovered one of them, they would look like a little gold cylinder that you could then carefully unwrap. I saw this particular one at the Getty Museum in California and it's on display there. If any of you live in California, you could maybe go see it. And this is a shorter one. There's 17 all together, they're usually rolled up and put 
next to the ear of the deceased. So if you're excavating an ancient Greek tomb, you have to be careful. Now, there are probably hundreds of these. Who knows? But only 17 have been found. They tend to date from the 4th to 5th century. I think there's one example that's in the early Roman period. But generally, they would be between Homer and Plato, but on down to the time of Plato. I would call these cue cards for the dead. It's telling the soul what to do when you descend down into the world of the dead. So let's read it. It's very exciting to read and get the idea. It's going to be kind of mysterious and an enigma like a puzzle. Remember, it's just a cue card for the dead, kind of uh, put by your ear so that as your soul departs the body and you're buried and go back to the dust, you're going to go down into Hades in the world of the dead. So here it is. Parch with thirst am I in dying. Nay, drink of me the ever-flowing spring. Where on the right is a fair cypress. Who are you? Where are you? I am the son of earth and star-filled heaven, but from heaven alone is my house, or it can mean my home. Wow. I hope you get the impact of this. Now, it's hard to figure out who's talking. There's some sort of a dialogue. Who are you? Where are you? Who, who is it that's asking that? But the last line is the key. I am the son of earth and star-filled heaven. That is the first literary example, archaeologically, of what later I would call Hellenistic dualism. In other words, the idea is, yes, my soul has gone to the world of the dead because I am a son of the earth, but I'm also the son of star-filled heaven and heaven alone is my home. Notice the term heaven alone. So this soul is telling the powers of the underworld who quiz it. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing down here? And if you know knowledge this is the word gnostic if you know who you are you can say to them very boldly i belong in heaven okay if we only had this shorter version it would be tough to totally figure it out but guess what look at this i sometimes used to joke with my students and say this is the uh dumb version for the dumb soul that might forget like that little cue card's not enough could could we explain it a little more so i won't mess this up okay same trip the dead soul is going down to the underworld you will find to the left of the house of hades a spring so it's actually giving you the geography when you get down here watch for this you're going to see a spring and by the side thereof standing a white cypress. So you will be able to recognize this landmark. But notice, to this spring, approach not near. Isn't that interesting? A warning. Now, the other text didn't have that. You would presumably know that, and you don't need the cue card for that, or the cue plate, the golden plate. To this spring, approach not near. But you shall find another from the lake of memory. We think this is the spring or the lake of forgetfulness. It's called Lethe. The soul is thirsty. It's had a long journey, death and afterlife and going down to Hades, crossing the river Styx. You've probably heard of that. Paying the ferryman, getting there. And what are you going to see? Water, water. And you begin to say water and you begin to drink. Then you're going to forget everything and you'll have to be born again. Now there's this endless cycle of reincarnation, of birth and death and rebirth and death. But if you don't drink that so that you won't forget your past, keep going. You'll find another from the lake of memory, cold water flowing forth. And there are guardians before it. So notice when you see the guardians, they're going to ask you, what are you doing here? Let's see if this soul knows what the cosmos is really all about. Does this soul know the mysteries, the secrets, the gnosis of 
the cosmos. And you, this is very bold. I am a child, you say this, I am a child of earth and starry heaven, but my race is of heaven alone. My genealogy, my race, in other words, I don't even belong in the world. I don't even belong in Hades. My race, my origin is heaven alone. This you know yourself. So these guardians are meant to kind of keep you in the world of death, but you can audaciously look them in the face and make this confession of faith. This is your confession of salvation. This is what Christians would later equate to something like, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead, who died for our sins, and so forth. It's a sort of bold confession of why you should be able to come out of Hades and ascend to heaven. Isn't that amazing? But notice, this you know yourselves. In other words, you know human beings have a heavenly destiny. And most humans might not realize that, but I realize it. This you know yourselves. But I am parched with thirst and I perish. Give me quickly the cold water flowing from the lake of memory. Not the lake of forgetfulness, but the lake of memory. And they themselves will give you to drink from the holy spring. And thereafter you will have lordship among the other heroes. I don't think it means in Hades, you're going to have a good place. Later in the time of Plato, Hades is divided into compartments and so forth. And we'll see that right at the end of these slides. I think this is saying you're going to have lordship in the heavens because you say heaven alone is my home. So this is just such an amazing text. Both of these, all 17 of them, essentially have the same idea. But this fuller version, I think we can see is the first hint that human beings in the West, in Greek tradition, are saying, yes, we go to Hades when we die, but guess what? That is not where we belong, and that, that is not our home. Isn't that amazing to think that this idea is beginning? Now, many of you will know Plato's allegory of the cave. I'm going to read through a portion of it here. It's in book seven of Plato's Republic. So Plato writes and he says, he's trying to explain it's, uh, you know, what is the soul and what is the body and why is the soul immortal? Just like he does in the Phaedo, which we're going to also take a look at today. And now I, Plato said, let me show you in a figure, like a parable, how far our nature is enlightened or unenlightened. Behold, imagine human beings living in an underground den. So this is just a parable. So you've got these human beings down below, which has a mouth open towards the light and reaching all along the den. And they've been there from childhood and they have their legs and necks chain so that they cannot move. So this is not Hades, anything like that. It's just an allegory, his allegory of a cave, making it up. As imagine a cave, imagine these people since childhood. And they can only see before them, so they can't turn their heads, being prevented by the chains from turning around their heads. Above and behind them, a fire is blazing at a distance. They can't see the fire. And between the fire and the prisons where they are, there's a raised way. And you will see, if you look, a low wall built along the way like the screen which marionette players have in front of them, over which they show their puppets. And this is a dialogue, so the person listening says, I see. Now let's go on. And do, and do you see, I said, men passing all along the wall, carrying all sorts of vessels and statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials, which appear over the wall. Some of them are talking, others are silent. And the response is, you've shown me a strange image and they are strange prisoners. And Plato says, like ourselves, I replied, they only see their shadows or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. 
And here's the response. True, he said. How could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? So you can see these responses are rather trite in the sense, uh, but it's sort of like, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? And then he goes on. And of the objects which are being carried in like manner, they would only see the shadows. So they can't really see what's making the shadow is the point. They can just see the shadows because they can't turn their heads and they're just seeing a projection on the wall. And if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? And the response is, yes, that's true. In other words, you say, what do you see there? And I say, I, I see a bird. I see a vessel. I see a human. I see a, a statue or whatever. And they would think the shadow is the real thing. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side, would they not be sure to fancy when one of the passerby spoke that the voice which they heard came from the passing shadows, almost like ventriloquists or something. So this is sort of elaborate. It doesn't make a lot of realistic sense, but stay with me here. You get the idea or stay with Plato, I should say. And then the response is no question, he replied. To them, I said, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. That is certain. So even if the images seem to speak or you hear some noise, it seems like the shadows are the reality. Now, what he goes on to say is, what if, here's, here's our, we'll go to Empedocles in a minute, but here's our, uh, here's a nice image of the cave. So here are people down here, they're chained. So you ask, what is their view of reality? What is their view of the world? And all they're seeing are these projections. See these images? There's a vessel and a horse and a circle and a bird. And then maybe some noise and the fire is projecting the shadows. And here the, they're being uh, manipulated like shadow puppets. Now, theoretically, and he goes on to say, what if they could get out of the chains for the first time? They've been there since childhood. And one of them gets out and he walks up the path, climbs up the ledge, goes out of the cave. And there he is. And he says, oh, my God, the world. Look at this. There's a sky and clouds and earth and light and everything, the smells, the sights, the sounds. All of a sudden. You're seeing reality. This is not reality. This is a shadow of reality. Okay, the allegory is that right now you, as a living, breathing human being, look around the world and you see objects, you hear voices, you see different shapes and different kinds of things in the world, but you're not seeing this world. This is the heavenly world. This is the real world. Even though in the analogy, the cave is our shadowy world of reality. And if you got out, you would see reality. So Plato is trying to say that when you die, you think you're seeing light right now. You think you're seeing a true object. He gave the example everybody uses of a chair. You know, that's a chair. It has four legs and a back and a seat. That's a chair. But that's just a shadow of the ultimate chair, which is in the heavenly world where all reality resides. And only your soul can see that reality, you see. Now, he goes on to say, what if this guy who escapes comes back and tells the people still chained, oh, look, 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 you don't understand. This is not real. If we could unchain you and take you above to this other world, you would see that these objects you're seeing are not the real objects, that are shadows of the objects. And you would see a world of light and life. So I hope everybody gets this. It's not about this world we know being light and life. This is the world we know. This is the heavenly world where people with immortal souls, which all humans have, really belong. So go back to the prayer on the golden plate. I'm a child of earth. 
the world of shadows, and heaven. But heaven alone is my home. There's my soul really belongs in heaven. My body is material, but my soul is heavenly or immortal. And that's what Plato taught. Now, there is a 5th century uh, BC uh, philosopher, Empedocles. Remember the one who jumps in the volcano of Etna to prove that he's a god? Uh, he, in one of his uh, lines of poetry, I, I've always loved this one because of the emotion. He's expressing this idea of, uh, of something like Plato's cave. I was once a fish, a bird, and now a man. I wept, I wept when I saw this dreadful place. Now what's happening here? Remember in the Hebrew view and in Gilgamesh, you're calling death, death, and life, life. So life is the world above. Also in Homer, Achilles does not want to stay on the world of the dead, right? He calls it the breathless dead. But now we're beginning to see a shift where this world of light and life, as we call it, is a mere shadow of the world to come. This is what we call Greek or later Hellenistic dualism. And it's the idea that the soul is the true self. The body is disposable. It goes back to the dust. And the soul does not belong in Hades or Sheol or the land of no return. The soul actually belongs in heaven with the gods, glorified with the gods. So Empedocles here is talking about this cycle of life, transmigration of the soul. He says, I was a fish. I was a bird, which is free and flying in the world. And now I'm man. But I wept, I wept when I saw this dreadful place. Look how opposite that is from the book of Genesis, where you create light. The world is light and life and death is back to the dust. In Shio, remember if I make my bed in Shio, remember all the words for Shio, pit, dark, silent. So Plato's allegory of the cave, as well as these archaeological texts on the golden plates, begin to give us a hint that the view that we see in Homer and on down into the 4th and 5th century BC, that seems to be widespread throughout the Greek world, we suddenly are beginning to get a shift. And the shift is profound. It's actually a complete reversal. It's saying that this world is not even the real world. And yes, you go to the world of the dead, but you don't belong in the world of the dead. Heaven alone is your home because you are an immortal soul, trapped or imprisoned in a physical body just as these are trapped or imprisoned in the cave. So I hope that was clear. It's a little complex. At the end of the Phaedo, which is Plato's dialogue put in the mouth of Socrates about the arguments for an immortal soul. We're not going to go over all of those, but he gives different arguments you know, of why uh, humans must have an immortal soul. The basic argument is like, as you, as your soul and mind and self moves the body, then it's superior to the body. It's the captain of the body. And therefore, it cannot be the body, even though it's in the body, housed in the body. It's a very common idea. And it really takes over the world. I often call this the idea that takes over the world, that humans are not life-breathing creatures on earth who die and go to the underworld of death, but they're actually immortal souls trapped in this world, which if anything could be considered a world of darkness. And to escape, they need to die so that death is birth. Death is life. How opposite from the ancient Near Eastern or the Hebrew view or even the Homeric view. Death is life. And life is a kind of a death. And Pedicles says, I wept, I wept when I saw this dreadful place, even though he had advanced 
from a fish to a bird to a human, still he knew this was not ultimately where my soul belongs. So let's talk about the death of Socrates in the Phaedo with the arguments. And at the end, you have this very chilling account, very moving account of Socrates drinking the cup of hemlock and slowly dying. His feet get numb and it begins moving up his body. And of course, when it reaches his heart, the poison, he finally dies. I really, really recommend everybody read it. It's in the final pages of the Phaedo. You can find it online. So what I wrote here, just to remind you of the times, the trial and execution of Socrates took place in 399 BCE. So that's a good number to remember, 399, 400. He was 70 years old. He was convicted of corrupting the youth and impiety towards the gods by asking open-ended philosophical questions. If you've read any of Plato's dialogues of Socrates, he's always asking his students questions. According to tradition, it was an outdoor academy, you might say, or symposium, where he and his disciples were sit, and he would just begin saying something like, uh, what is truth? And then you would have a whole dialogue on truth, and they're just beautiful to read. If you've never read the uh, dialogues of Plato, you can get them easily. They're also online. Everything's online now. It's so wonderful. Uh, read them. They're, they're kind of complex but the, but uh, because of the reasoning and the arguing. But it's sort of like philosophy 101. You got to read Plato's dialogues. Anyway, the Phaedo is one of those. And it's the argument, as I said, for the immortal soul. So what we know of his, he, he chooses death rather than flight or exile. He was given the choice to go into exile and leave Athens. This is in Athens. But uh, he decides, no, uh, that would be running away. That would be caving in. That would be giving up on who I am and what I'm really all about. We know of his ideas from Plato. Plato was his student. So people get Plato and Socrates mixed up. Plato's writing after the death of Socrates. So if you think of 400 for Socrates and his death, then Plato's writing in the fourth century. Here's a very famous scene of Socrates sitting up, ready to drink the poison. Notice the servant who brings the poison, can't even look, everybody's weeping. He sent the women and children out. Here they are because they were weeping hysterically and saying, we're going to miss you, and so forth. And now he's talking to his disciples, and they're also weeping. And basically, he says, weep not for me, weep for yourselves. I'm the one who's leaving this cave, this world of shadows that you call light. But the light that you call light is actually darkness, and I'm going to ascend into the heavens. Now, in the time of Plato, this sort of system of thought includes birth, death, rebirth, death, rebirth, this sort of chain of being where you're trapped in the mortal body, you go to the world of Hades, and if you are not morally developed or spiritually developed, and you don't know who you really are, remember Gnosis again, you don't have that knowledge of what salvation is, then you can be born and reborn and reborn an infinite number of times. You get the idea that Socrates believes that this is his last run, that he might have had many lives in the past, but now he spent his life teaching truth, teaching enlightenment, being enlightened himself, and he's ready to ascend and be with the gods. Now, Here's his conclusion. It's all the way through the Phaedo, but this really, really puts it very clearly. Here's what he says. Then it is as certain as anything can be, KBs, that's one of his students, that the soul is immortal and imperishable and that our souls will really exist in the next world. Now, if you're not ready yet to ascend to the world of heaven, of the gods, 
then you still would have to go through another cycle of birth and death and birth and death and so forth. But in the conclusion of the Phaedo, we have the sad account of Socrates' death. So this is really interesting. Here's what the disciples say right before he dies. It's right at the end. Well, Socrates, do you wish to leave any directions with us about your children or anything else? Anything we can do to serve you? I want you to notice the irony of his answer. What I always say, Crito, Crito is the one talking, another disciple. He replied, what I always say, Crito, nothing new. If you take care of yourselves, you will serve me and mine and yourselves and whatever you do, even if you make no promises now. And they, they answer, we will certainly try hard to do as you say. And then he asks, I think this is still Crito, but how shall we bury you? Notice this is so interesting. How shall we bury you? However you please, he replied, if you can catch me and I do not get away from you. And he laughs. That's Plato right there. Catch me if you can. In other words, how shall we bury you? That's the body of dust, right? Are you really burying Socrates? Even And they're talking about mundane things, like what can we do? You're dying, you're leaving. What about your affairs, your financial affairs, what you own or anything about your family? And he's saying, just take care of yourselves. Take care of yourselves and remember what I taught you. And you will then be serving me. That's all I need. And as far as burial, well, just see what happens. If you can catch me, bury me. So that's very ironic. And then you have this final statement after he laughs at that. Credo, please pay a cock which I owe to Asclepius. Isn't that interesting? Asclepius, you got to know, is the god of healing. And he's saying that he owes a rooster to Asclepius. Now, people have endlessly discussed what this means. Let me tell you the interpretation that I find most persuasive. If Asclepius is the god of healing, then what is the healing of a soul in this world who's in the dark cave of reality, the physical world below? What is the healing? Death. Death is the healing. So he says, go, I'm going, I'm dying. Go offer the God of healing a rooster as a, a sacrifice or a tribute to pay for the fact that I'm healed. Not that I'm healed of any kind of disease or physical ailment or anything, disability, but rather I'm healed because I'm dying. Death is the healer. Death is birth. And life or birth is death into the cave, into the dark world. Wow. This is, you talk about opposite from Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, there's light and life and all the creation and everything is pronounced good. I think it's six times good, 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 good. And the last time is very good. All that God made is good. This positive view of the world, that the world is the place to be. The world is the home. Gilgamesh is told, rejoice with your wife and dance and bathe yourself and have pleasure and eat, drink and be merry because life is what you've been given. You're not a God and you're going to die. And then you're going to go into the land of no return the house of dust. Remember that from the previous segment. This I found very moving. Such was the end, Ecrecrates, of our friend, who was, as we may say, of all those of his time whom we have known, the best and wisest and most righteous man. And that's right at the point where the poison reaches his heart, his limbs are already numb. And he passes away, as we say. So here are some of the notes that explain what I just went over. 
I won't repeat them again, but when you're viewing this, you'll have kind of a review if you want to pause it and take any screenshots. One of the things I didn't mention is right here, though. What can we do to serve you? We talked about how shall we bury you? Death seems like a great misfortune. And when you're left behind, we say sorry for your loss. You're like orphans in grief. You're orphaned. This is the feeling of the disciples of Plato. But Socrates tells them throughout that they should realize that death is not a loss, but a gain. So the question is, how do you depart? Quietly and bravely. However, Socrates is not interested in prolonging the day of his death or having a final meal. That's another thing that comes up. What Do you want your final meal? He sees no point in it. But when the time of death arrives, you face it as the course you have to take. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, if this is true, why don't we just leave? Why do we even live our lives? Should we commit suicide, as, as it's later called? Should we take our own lives? Why don't we all drink poison? You're telling us what a great and amazing thing it is to leave the cave. And what Socrates says is, you've been stationed by the gods to learn in this world of darkness, which looks like light to you, but it's really darkness. So you've got, it's like you're on duty. It's your post, he calls it. You've been assigned to this post and you're supposed to learn the lessons that are assigned to you from your last incarnation. But when you're ready at the right time, you will know it and you can depart and leave, but you would never take your life in order to get there. It reminds me of the Sunday school joke of uh, the Christian Sunday school teacher telling the kids about heaven and how good it's going to be. Can't we, we just can't wait to get to heaven. Jesus will be there and God will be there and it'll be wonderful. And then she says at the end to see how effective her teaching has been, how many of you want to go to heaven? And a bunch of them, you know, they're raising their hand. You know how little kids wave their hands like this, you know, me, me, me. And one kid doesn't raise his hand and she asks him, you know, what's wrong? Uh, you don't want to go to heaven? Did I fail in my lesson? And he says, yes, I want to go to heaven, but I thought you were getting a group to go now. So I always thought that was so funny. And it does capture the idea. I've been at funerals, Christian funerals, uh, where the preacher gets up and says to the grieving relatives on the front pew with the casket open right in front of him, and they're bawling and crying and they're sad at the loss. And he tells them, dry your eyes. This is a happy day. This is a day of rejoicing. Our dear departed brother or sister is with Christ and we should be happy rather than sad. It doesn't go over very well because, you know, burying a body or cremating a body is an incredibly heavy experience. I've experienced it. Some of you probably have. And uh, it just doesn't fit our perception of reality. So isn't this amazing that you do have here? Here is the view of Hades that begins to develop. It is mapped out. Remember, you can cross the river Styx. You got to have a coin to pay Charon, the ferryman. Once you go into the river Styx, you have to get through the gates of Hades. This is where you're kind of judged. There's a judgment pavilion. And some are more punished. This is in more the later view. Uh, they have to atone for their sins. They have to learn their lessons. And then there are people that are more neutral. And then there are also the Isles of the Blessed. But I take it that as the tradition goes on, even though the Isles of the Blessed, the Elysium is very pleasant to be in, that's certainly where Achilles would be if he was part of this kind of worldview. But he says, you know, I would rather be a slave or a manual laborer following a plow a poor person 
digging the dirt than to be lord of this whole kingdom of Hades. So in Homer's time, even though there could be this idea of a blessed reward for the dead, uh, by the time you get to Plato and beginning with like these golden plates with Empedocles, with some of the Orphic views that we find, death is life or birth and birth is death. I wept, I wept when I saw this dreadful place. So we're going to pick this up in another part later, the Hellenistic reversal, the great Hellenistic reversal where humans who belong on earth begin to believe that they actually belong in heaven. And this world is a dark shadow of existence. That may not be your view, but it's a view that literally takes over the world. It's the foundation of all Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's also the foundation of lots of new age thinking. It's not Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, but it's just this idea that is very common in our day of karma and reincarnation. And this world is a school in which we're to learn something. And then at death, we hope we can advance and move on and finally be one with God. So we'll continue exploring these things. I hope this was meaningful to you, and I'll see you next time.